Vidya, you can start. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, everybody assembled here. On behalf of Pulp 22, I take immense pleasure in beginning the scientific session by Dr. Kritika Datta, which will be moderated by Dr. Paramita Mazundar, ma'am. Dr. Paramita Mazundar, ma'am, graduated from A.R. Ahmed Dental College and Hospital, Kolkata, in 1996 with honors in pharmacology and gold medal in orthodontics and periodontics. Later on, she went to accomplish her MBS in conservative dentistry and endodontics in 2003 from the same college. And ma'am has been guiding postgraduate students for the last 13 years and has been heading the Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics at Guru Nanak Institute of Dental Sciences and Research since 2017. Dr. Paromita ma'am has 63 original research publications in index journals, presents oral scientific papers at various platforms and has been a reviewer at various national and international journals. Ma'am, we have immense pleasure in having you in this forum and the stage is all yours, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very glamorous introduction. But uh, here I would like to introduce the speaker for the day, Dr. Kritikanta, Associate Editor of Journal of Dentistry from 2008 to 2015 and has also been as the she has been honored with various awards and she has 32 publications in indexed peer reviewed journals. In 2021, she was awarded the Diplomate of the Indian Board of Endodontics during the 12th IFIA World Endodontic Congress. She's passionate about research and her area of interest is periodology. Her research interests include understanding dental disease dynamics, which is in vulnerable Indian population. That is a specific area of interest Hades biofilm model and biomechanics of dentine. In 2020, at Savita, which is the first of its kind, and she's currently heading two departments. I think that. So it is an immense pleasure and an honor for me to introduce Dr. Kritika Datta, and we all look forward to a very, very informative session. And thanks to Mahalakshmi Ma'am for organizing such a program and having me as one of the moderators. Over to Dr. Tikadatta. Thank you so much, Dr. Parathima. You're always kind with your introductions. Feels good to start early in the morning with this. Let me just share my screen right away. Um, at the outset, uh, uh, as you all would have heard that uh, cardiology is um, getting a lot of interest these days. And I've always felt that cardiology has not been approached in the way that it should have been. And uh, with due respect to all the efforts that have been made uh, by different uh, departments and the different institutions, it still needs to conglomerate into uh, a holistic uh, subject. So instead of... Uh, talking topics, we thought that revisiting the same disease through a different perspective and a different lens would probably add on to clarity and uh, understand the disease as such uh, in today's scenario. At the outset, I would uh, like to thank um, uh, team SRM, Mahalakshmi Ma'am, Raj Sir, and the entire organizing team behind Pulp for uh, having such an innovative program for uh, focusing on undergraduate uh, students. It's really heartening to see how uh, uh, this effort is made in making them aware of uh, what is the potential of our speciality and uh, uh, it really adds on value to our own speciality. Congrats to the entire team at SRM and thank you for uh, having me at the prime time slot. So I, I have to be, I really feel honored that uh, Kariology is receiving a prime time uh, spot as the opening lecture for uh, the Pulp series. Now, uh, I would like to place on record that whatever uh, today I am, I, I have achieved is um, not just one person's efforts, but a lot of people's inputs and uh, uh, their uh, advice. And speci especially, I would want to uh, thank these people, Dr. Usha, who had first uh, introduced me to the subject of cardiology when I was still a postgraduate student in 2004. But for her, I would not have looked at it differently. 
later on uh, Dr. David Manton in 2010, who introduced me to the international platform where uh, a lot of cardiologists are working. And in 2013, Dr. Um, uh, Dominic Zero, who has um, opened up a huge uh, avenue for me personally to look at uh, the, the disease process itself in a different manner. Of course, a good uh, mentor and friend, Dr. Anil Kishan, uh, who has um, tried to channelize my thoughts uh, into the right direction, even though he does not do cardiology himself, but uh, uh, biofilm connects uh, both of us uh, in common. And of course, Dr. Muthu, uh, he's a huge inspiration uh, and uh, a role model for a lot of uh, youngsters because uh, he is doing an immense uh, work in um, cardiology in pediatric population. So uh, yeah, these are the people who have had a very positive impact apart from them, my teachers and friends who have always been there for me. Another um, uh, organization that I would want to draw attention to all of yours is um, ORCA, the European Organization for KDS Research. This is an international organization who has been working almost uh, for about 70 years in trying to understand and uh, make progresses in dental KDS. This year is their 70th annual conference uh, at Rome. And uh, it's, it's really heartening to see how uh, passionate people are uh, from all across the globe come, uh, come together at ORCA and trying to uh, further our knowledge on cardiology. So for anybody who's interested in cardiology, this is your uh, portal for uh, exhilaration. This is where I found my uh, calling. So I would recommend this uh, heavily for uh, all of you all. And before uh, we go on to the subject, I would definitely want to uh, uh, remember, recollect the memories that I have spent at Minakshi Amal Dental College with Team ODS. Uh, I think they have been a family to me all, all the while uh, when I was with them. And uh, I'm back at my alma mater. It's now um, 18 years since uh, I finished my uh, BDS and I'm back here and it feels like yesterday. It feels like I have, uh, I have just finished my undergraduation and I'm suddenly uh, in the department uh, trying to teach cardiology to students. So it feels so nice, it feels so fresh. And um, uh, fortunately uh, for uh, me, the, the management had thought about having cardiology as a separate department because they uh, felt that this subject needs to be taught at an undergraduate level. So I'm just going to share um, uh, the experience, how this has evolved and how, what we have to look at when we are talking, to, uh, talking about the dental caries to the undergraduate students, as well as the postgraduate students. Without wasting much time, let's directly go to this uh, subject of understanding dental caries through lesion severity and lesion activity. Now, when we look at the caries dynamics itself, there are two components. One is the disease expression, which we are uh, objectively measuring in terms of cavities. This is what we all look at when we look into the oral cavity. How many cavities are there? How, is there a catch on pro? So this is what we often look for in the dental OP. So this uh, uh, is something that we conventionally do. But what we also, what is parallelly happening along with the cavities that are occurring uh, in a random process in the oral cavity is that something is making this happen. Something behind this cavity is actually making this initiate and progress into deeper cavities until it reaches the pulp. That is the disease process. So one is disease expression and the other is disease process. Now the disease process, if you just want to measure it instantly and uh, get a heads up, if you don't have any other tool, you don't have access to any other knowledge, you just want to see the mouth and see that cavity and decide what kind of a disease state that person is, we look into the lesion activity. So that is a direct measure of how severe the disease is at that point in time in a patient's mouth. So we've always looked for disease expression, that is the cavities, but now we should also start looking at lesion activity, which gives us a direct heads up about the caries disease process. 
Now to measure the lesion activity, uh, lesion progression, we have something called as ICDAS. Uh, it's a comprehensive dental caries charting system, which gives us the progression of dental caries right from remineralizing, re remineralizable lesions towards deep uh, dentin cavities. And the management of this disease itself is uh, put forth by a concept called as ICCMS. So this is all that we will be seeing in today's lecture. Uh, what is more important is to change the way first unlearn the process of how we have understood dental caries and start relearning a different process which will take closer to our goal of dental caries management. So starting with disease expression, the caries lesion, people have uh, uh, put forth different philosophies and different methods to measure this. The age old method that we probably still use in our dental colleges is the flux classification. This was based purely on the site of the cavities that were formed. This classification was a lot relevant when we just had amalgam to deal with the cavities in that era. So Black's classification, though it's most convenient classification, was actually put forth to decide how to go about cavity preparations when we just had amalgam to deal with. Later on, you had the DMF index, which started measuring dental caries, uh, cavities again in a population along with their disease expression or the disease experience rather. Then later on came on uh, Mountain Hue. So that was a huge leap from until about the uh, 1990s, we were all just comfortable measuring and uh, reporting dental caries in the usual normal way, DMF index for the population and Black's classification for clinical assessment. But Hue, uh, Mountain Hue made a huge breakthrough in trying to categorize the site and size of the lesion. So that led to, that was possible because of the change in the materials that were available for us to restore the cavities. And then we had Nivard's diagnostic criteria, significant caries index, specific index, and a lot of other indices. So what happens is that people are trying to basically tell us as to what how differently we can measure the DK and hence have an understanding on the disease process itself. But when you want to measure this DK through its progression, we need to understand what is happening in, a, uh, in the mouth, in the oral cavity when the disease actually sets in and how it progresses. Consider normal uh, enamel is, is made up of hydroxyapatite crystals. It is a stable, it is in a dynamic stable state, which means that there are ion exchange happening at the surface of the enamel back and forth. So some ions may be lost, some ions may be gained. So that keeps happening back and forth. So that is a dynamically stable state. That's not a disease state. When the pH drops further below 5.5, then there is active demineralization happening at the enamel level. When this demineralization happens, it's not that directly calcium and phosphate are lost from the surface. There are actually intermediary compounds that are formed, that is octacalcium phosphate or the Wittlockite crystals or dicalcium phosphate dihydride. So these two crystals are the intermediary uh, breakdowns of the actual hydroxyapatite crystals to prevent the loss of minerals from the enamel prism itself. It's a humble plea or a cry not to lose this calcium and phosphate out into the uh, oral environment. Only up if, the, if the situation reverses and the pH is pumping up above 5.5, then this octacalcium phosphate and dicalcium phosphate dihydrate gets uh, deposited back into the enamel prism, that, thus maintaining a remineralization. Now, when the process progresses and the uh, pH does not bounce back above 5.5 and it is sustained below 5.5 over a period of time, then you have consistent demineralization happening. So when we say consistent demineralization happening, there is calcium and phosphate ions constantly being lost. Now, nature has made the enamel prisms in such a beautiful way 
that it's not easy to just develop cavities. So if you see the lines, the uh, each of these uh, gray bars indicates the, uh, assume that that indicates the uh, enamel prisms itself. So you have four bars of enamel prisms. The demineralization first initiates from the center of the prism. So the central most core is something that's losing the calcium and phosphate and it laterally spreads to, to the periphery of the prism. The reason why nature has constructed it in this way is because if there is an event to remineralize, then the central core, the architecture is still maintained and the central core just gets deposited with calcium and phosphate salts. And that is if there is fluoride present in the environment, it is even better because the remineralization takes place along with the formation of fluorapatite crystals. Now, fluorapatite crystals are very useful because they don't demineralize at the critical pH of 5.5. They need a further acidic pH to cause demineralization. So they start dissolving only at 4.5. This if we are, if there is some fluoride source available in our mouth. But unfortunately, if the uh, demineralization progresses in the, in the negative direction and uh, a more and more of ions are lost, then there is complete breakdown of this enamel prism resulting in micro cavities. So it actually takes a lot of effort for a cavity to be formed. The nature itself, is the, because uh, we all know that enamel is an avascular and an acellular structure, you cannot have the host defense to act in at that place and defend the disease process. While formation of the enamel itself, these defense mechanisms are inherently placed in the architecture of the enamel. But sadly, when the uh, critical pH does not bounce above 5.5, demineralization continues, resulting in micro cavities, that's when enamel starts breaking down. Now, once the enamel starts breaking down, the uh, surface becomes rough and the biofilm formation on the surface becomes that much more easier. So that will cause further, once the enamel is broken down, the integrity is broken, it's very difficult for the enamel to remineralize. And when it reaches dentine, even at a pH of 6.7, the dentine demineralization starts initiating. As we all know, dentine is more of, uh, uh, enamel is more of inorganic matter con uh, compared to dentine. Dentine only has 65% inorganic, while 35% of the dentine matrix is made up of organic material, predominantly collagen. So dentine demineralization uh, is uh, happens at a much faster rate and at a much higher pH compared to enamel breakdown. Now, this acid, there's not just acid dissolution that is happening. As the decay progresses further into dentine, there is also choice of bacteria that will populate in the biofilm that will cause the destruction of the organic matter. That's called the proteolytic dissolution. So these two mechanisms are now happening. In enamel, it is predominantly only demineralization, whereas when it reaches dentine, the caries progression is both through demineralization, through acid dissolution, and uh, degradation of the collagen by proteolytic activity. So this ultimately results in a deep dentine caries. So this is the actual disease process from uh, sound enamel, to remineralizable lesions, to cavities in enamel, and then followed by cavities in dentine. Imagine we have a method or a system that measures the progress of the disease in, in the way it progresses and allows us to measure each of these time points in clinically so that we can act or manage the lesions in that manner. That's what led to the uh, development and the uh, proposition of ICDAS. ICDAS stands for International Caries Detection and Assessment System. It was first proposed in 2002 and then finalized in 2005. So this is predominantly based on the works between uh, 1990 to 2000, wherein a lot of uh, these researchers um, uh, who were actively involved in understanding. So, so that era was predominantly towards understanding dental caries progression. 
So what does this IC does comprise of? It comprises of two numbers or two decision numbers. The first decision number is uh, for the state of, of the tooth, whether it is a uh, filled tooth or a healthy tooth or uh, what filling is present. So based on that, the first number allocated in ICTA stands for the status of the tooth. If there's nothing present and it's, it's a fresh tooth or virgin tooth, we just give a number zero. So one stands for sealant, which is partial. Uh, partially lost and two stands for sealant which is fully lost and then three stands for any tooth colored restoration four is for amalgam so the first number denotes the status of the tooth why is it important to measure in what state it is is because it gives us an understanding as to how much problem the tooth has already suffered so a zero versus a four uh, a number shows us that Four automatically says that the tooth was previously diseased, which was treated with amalgam, whereas zero refers to as this is the first attack of dental caries on that particular tooth. So that is the information that we derive from the first decision. In case of uh, uh, missing tooth, there are several combinations which uh, the ICDAS team puts forth, it, uh, 9, 9, 7, 9, 8, and 9N, all refers to tooth that are missing or surfaces that cannot be examined. What is more relevant in measuring the disease severity is the uh, decision number two, which is the actual ICDAS scoring. So this is a uh, six point uh, scoring system which starts with zero. Zero refers to sound tooth where there is no evidence of uh, any demineralization or caries cavity formation after drying for five seconds. First denotes the first visual change. Number uh, score one denotes the first visual change in enamel which is seen as an opaque layer but this opaque surface is visible only upon drying. Whereas the code two refers to a distinct change in enamel with opaqueness seen even on wet, wet enamel. So this is the, these two stages, the first and the second scores basically denotes the uh, white spot lesion stage, which can undergo remineralization if the conditions are reversed. Now to look for these two uh, scores, it is not enough if we just look into the mouth these scores or this surface demineralization often occurs under a thick plaque layer. So whenever we look into a patient's mouth and when we find plaque, if we remove that plaque, that's where you will find these two scores. So for ICDAS documentation or ICDAS evaluation, it is mandatory that all the surfaces are cleaned with pumice uh, slurry paste on your slow speed hand pieces. Otherwise, we can easily miss out the score one and two. Score three is the actual enamel breakdown, but the breakdown is localized to the enamel itself. There is no progression of this breakdown to go past the dentino enamel junction. And this can be seen when the tooth is wet. Number four is uh, a dark shadow that is seen from the underlying dentine where the enamel is still intact. So when uh, score three is enamel breakdown, score four, there is no enamel breakdown. The enamel is intact, but you can see the dentine underneath has undergone demineralization and it is seen as a black area under intact enamel. Score four, score five is something that we commonly see in our uh, clinical evaluation. It is a distinct cavity into dentine. Or uh, if we have, if I have to strike a similarity with uh, the common jargon that is used, this is where you find the catch in probe phrase. So when WHO uh, criteria for detecting DK says a catch on probe signifies cavitation, this score denotes that stage. So you can see that WHO criteria actually misses out all the scores from one to four, and they actually start recording or documenting DK only from score five. And score six is, is something that cannot be missed at all. It is extensive cavitation into dentine. Uh, these teeth typically go into deep caries management or 
pulpal management based on the symptoms that the patient reports with. So this is the uh, scoring criteria that is to be mentioned in the decision two. So decision one is the status of the tooth, whether it is sound or restored and based on the restoration that is available, there are several codes. And decision two is the actual severity score of the DK progression. It's score zero is no DK and score six is extensive cavitation. Now let us just see what these scores look or how these scores look clinically. So, so ICTAS score, if you see, typically will look like this. So you, if you have to identify an ICTAS score one, you have to dry the tooth completely. There should not be any plaque present in the groove or the smooth surface area. Only then you can see. And when you're looking out for score one, we should not be looking at the depth of the fissure because the depth of the fissure is actually a hollow space where plaque forms is actually on the walls of the fissure where your demineralization can also take place. So when looking out for scores one and two, please do not look into the groove because that's not where change is happening. A groove is basically a hollow space where we actually need to look into is the surface or the walls of the fissure just adjacent to the groove. So white spot lesion upon drying for five seconds is score one. And white spot lesion without drying, if it is seen, then that is your score two. Here you can see that the saliva is you know, intentionally left it flooding so that you can see how the walls of the fissure or just above the fissure, you can see white spot lesions formed. Now, when you see the zones of caries of enamel, this is how it will look. What we saw clinically will look uh, histopathologically or on a ground section like this. Now, what happens is the surface layer is predominantly intact. And then you have the translucent porous zone, which is at the base of the lesion. The pore size is only about 1%. Where the body of the lesion, you have a huge pore size, almost to 5 to 25%. So that's where you have active calcium and phosphate salts that are lost. Though you can see the changes on the ground section, you can still see that the architecture is still intact. There is no breakdown of the surface. Neither is there a breakdown of the prism matrix itself. So this is the depth of the entire demineralization. We will not find demineralization starting on the surface most often because the surface is something that is commonly exposed to salivary fluids and whatever we eat. So the surface most commonly will be in fluor appetite in nature. So the demineralization, if it has to progress, starts from the subsurface area of the enamel. And then you have the dark zone, which is just above the translucent zone with a pore volume of four to uh, two to four percent. So when we are trying to remineralize, we are looking at remineralizing the body of the lesion to ensure that the strength of the enamel is also established. Next, moving on to the next uh, score of ICDAS, score three is the distinct change in enamel or the early enamel breakdown. So you can see that small pit on the labial surface is the localized breakdown. It's not further progressed into dentine, but the surface is lost, that it is not a smooth layer. Why it is important to identify score three is because these are very, very small cavities that actually do not require tooth preparation. Please hear me out. You don't have to take a burr and drill on this uh, specific uh, lesion to, in order to fill it. You can just etch it, clean it, and fill it with a sealant. Maybe a resin uh, infiltration method if the pore sizes are, or if the cavity size is very small, or even a simple flowable composite, a low viscosity flowable composite should do the trick. Now you can see that in the same tooth on the distal aspect, you have a white opaque patch. So that is your uh, score two uh, that is present because you've not dried the tooth, the tooth is still wet. And uh, this is how you will have presentation of your disease severity. It's not like a tooth will have only one score. A tooth will have a series or a range of scores that you'll have to identify and see what treatment you want to initiate. 
score four will typically look like this a dark shadow you can see that the enamel surface is perfectly intact but caries is progressing from the proximal aspect here enamel breakdown has not happened but you know if you take your down bore and drill that cavity you know that you will end up in a huge cavity this is in an anterior uh, proximal surface scenario this is in a posterior pit and fissure scenario you can see that everything is intact nothing has broken down actually but you also when you look at this tooth you know that something is not right about it there's something happening in the dentine in such cases when you take a small round burr and open up that fissure you can see a huge cavity that is uh, you know exploding in front of your eyes this is typically called as the score 4 lesion and uh, this is how it is clinically present. Now, score four lesion is something that is very tricky and something that can be very easily missed if we don't look for this dark shadow. And that's why it's been included in the system. Score five and score six actually does not need any explanation. This is something that we have been trained to look for and treat. So this is score six, extensive cavitation into dentine with, the, with visible dentine seam. So this is just a, a small algorithm or a flow chart on how to go about looking for these lesion uh, as through the severity process. First, we need to clean the teeth and see whether there is anything visible without drying. If you don't see anything, then you dry the tooth and then you check for score zero or code zero and code one. If upon drying there is discoloration, and you have to see, without drying, you have to see whether there is any microcavitation present. If there is not present, then you have to just uh, as you, uh, mark it as score two. And then if you see any distinct uh, breakdown in the enamel, you have to see whether it is within the enamel or it has progressed into the dentine. Accordingly, you will mark it as score uh, three, four, five, and six. So this is just a brief algorithm for a uh, quick clinical reference on your chair side. I'm just sharing a few more examples because uh, this is uh, uh, a method that will take time initially, initially only because it's a different method of scoring. It's a new technique. So until we master the technique, it is going to take some time. Typically, a beginner will have to spend about 15 minutes on a patient to make sure that he has scored all the surfaces and all the teeth appropriately. But trust me, as and when you are uh, getting better at it, you will spend less time. You can, in fact, finish an entire ICDA scoring within five minutes. But the, but the information that you get in that five minutes is very, very vital because that's what is going to tell us how we are going to not only treat that lesion, but also have an understanding of what disease state that person is. So if you see this tooth now, uh, the cervical band of this molar has a heavy plaque accumulation and you can see some score two, uh, uh, score, score two happening. The buccal pit has got uh, a distinct cavity into the extending into the dentine, so that's score five. The uh, occlusal pits and fissures so shows areas of just deep grooves in some areas. And it also shows uh, uh, marginal breakdown in the, especially along the buccal groove of the uh, occlusal fissure. So this is how we will look at uh, dental caries, cavitation or uh, severity in a tooth. It will not always be that a tooth will decide, decide that, okay, I'm just going to stop with score one or score two. I'm not going to progress to score three. It's all dependent on the tooth morphology, the amount of plaque accumulated in that particular site that determines the uh, lesion progression or the severity of the disease. So always look out for multiple scores on a particular tooth. So this, again, I would want to draw attention uh, to this particular tooth. Most often I see students marking this groove as a carious uh, groove or a carious lesion because you see some dark uh, uh, line, black line, uh, which would probably uh, indicate that it is carious. But this is not a carious tooth or a carious fissure. If you just uh, focus a little bit on the lingual surfaces, that, that's all that you can see here. If you examine 
that you can see that a lot of stains present on the entire tooth itself. So if you examine further into the oral cavity, you will also find a lot of stains present. So people who are into heavy smoking or who consume a lot of tobacco or also are into this habit of constant coffee tea consumption will have such a presentation. Please don't confuse these grooves as uh, carious in nature. These are just stained grooves. So to identify a difference between uh, enamel um, uh, carious and uh, uh, stained groove, what we usually do is to run the probe along the groove. If the probe feels smooth while you run it along, then there is no cavitation or micro cavitation present. When you feel that the surface is rough, then probably there is some lesion that is starting in that space. And when I say probe, please make sure that you don't use a shark probe. Shark probes are no longer indicated for detecting cavities. Only a ball-ended probe or a CPITN probe is indicated for exploring cavities, especially when they are within the enamel. Why we need to uh, ca uh, take caution in this is because when you use a sharp probe, you can inadvertently cause microcavitation within the enamel, a surface that could have remineralized by itself. So never use a sharp probe. So this, uh, if you see the central pit on the molar has a score three. There is initial enamel breakdown without progress of the cavity into the dentine. If this the same tooth had progressed into the dentine, you will also see some darkening of um, the enamel around this small uh, enamel breakdown. The reason why like something like that is present on the palatal groove. The reason why we need to identify score three is because this particular lesion that is there does not require tooth preparation. You don't have to take the smallest size round burr or a fissurotomy burr and drill and fill this cavity. You can just seal this uh, uh, small cavity with your pit and fissure sealant itself. So that is how it is uh, changed. The treatment strategies have changed when it comes to managing dental caries. This again is a microcavitation present within the enamel. You can also see that it is darker in color, showing the incidence or giving us a clue that it is trying to heal by itself. So such cavities actually do not need to be drilled and filled. You can just use pit and fissure sealants. So this is uh, another uh, example for score two on the occlusal surfaces. Such uh, lesions you will usually find in freshly erupting uh, teeth. When a tooth is newly erupting into the oral cavity, then the occlusal surfaces may show this kind of a presentation. Why this happens in a newly erupting teeth is because of two reasons. One is because when the tooth is erupting, it's not yet reached the occlusal plane. So when the patient or the kid is brushing the tooth, the bristles may not reach the occlusal surface to uh, render it clean of any plaque. That is one reason. And the second reason is that the tooth is still not fully matured. What, what I'm trying to say is that the enamel is still uh, not fully mineralized and exposed to the saliva to form fluorapatite layer. So the surface of a newly erupted tooth will have more of a carbonate. So when you're having a kid who is in this eruptive age, right from your age six towards to up to age 15, you can expect such occlusal enamel changes. Now, this is again another uh, score uh, three, where you don't have to actually uh, drill and fill the cavity. You can just seal it along the, just along the distal groove and the buccal groove. There is no need for cavity preparation. Now, I put this the uh, picture in purpose because uh, people who are not trained enough to look out for cavities will easily miss a score four in this particular scenario. So when I say score four, you're starting to look for uh, uh, darkening of dentine. If you look further closer between the contacts of the between the five and the six, you can see that there is some grayish blackish discoloration that you can easily miss if you didn't look for it. So why this probably happens here is because you can see that the premolar is a little bit rotated. It's not fully in contact 
with the molar and the lingual or the palatal embrasure is broadened up that could allow plaque formation in that space and thus causing a proximal caries. So whenever you have any malocclusion present, kindly check for the prox proximal areas to see if you find a clinical image like this. This is very, very important. Also, this kind of an representation can happen in patients who have gingival recession. Once the gingiva recedes, the embrasure is vacant, you have biofilm formation of the proximal area, and it can result in a score 4 lesion like this. This is a typical score 5, a score 6. So these scores are generally we will not uh, tend to miss clinically. So the time, as, as I said, there are certain challenges with ICDAS. It is time consuming initially to begin with. And your calibration as an, uh, a person who's examining using ICDAS needs to be uh, learned. It's not something that happens overnight. You need to be trained to be uh, able to use ICDAS effectively. And also assessing proximal lesions can sometimes be a huge challenge. So ICDAS, whenever you're using, you always use it along with bite wing radiographs so that you don't miss any proximal lesions. Bite wing radiographs are the only uh, foolproof method that is currently available for us to detect early uh, proximal lesions that are restricted within enamel. So uh, we have to make provision for bite wing radiographs in the clinical practice as well. So this was all about the disease progression. Now we will see a little bit about lesion activity. This is something that we don't actually pay a heed, but this is a direct measure of how bad the caries is. Now, uh, there was a lot of uh, work that went on between 2000 to 2010 to see how we can manage risk or how to identify the various risk factors. And then they finally ended up with uh, this uh, uh, representation that it is a huge multifactorial disease and a lot of factors protect and a lot of factors uh, harm the tooth when it comes to caries uh, disease itself. So it is very difficult for us to measure all of this in a clinical scenario. So what can be easily measured is the lesion activity. We just have to look out for two things. One is the appearance of the tooth and second is how it feels when you run your uh, ball ended probe. And this is different for enamel and dentine. Let's just start with the appearance of enamel. What happens in a normal uh, uh, situation when the light is incident on enamel, when the surface is intact, newly, uh, newly formed or uh, mature enamel, there is isometric reflection of the light that is incident. So you'll always see a glossy surface if the enamel is healthy. But when there is porosity formation and the surface gets dissolved, uh, just demineralization takes place, this light does not undergo isometric reflection and there is some amount of scatter. That is the reason why we see uh, white opaque spots. So a white opaque spots that uh, even when you see, look at it, it, sees, it seems to be rough. That is an indication of your uh, enamel lesions being active in stage. So when you see an active lesion, that means that the person is currently having the disease. Say if you have to strike uh, an example in a, a common systemic condition, when you have sore throat, you know that you're going to develop cold. Or when a person is sneezing, you know that that person has got cold. Likewise, if you see a rough looking opaque enamel, then you know for sure that the patient is having or suffering from dental caries disease at that moment. Next is the tactile sensation. When you feel for the enamel, it will just feel rough compared to the enamel adjacent to it, which will be a healthy enamel that will feel smooth. So this is with regards to enamel. Moving on to dentine, again, the same two criteria apply. Appearance of dentine, uh, uh, active dentine caries will look light brown in color versus a uh, arrested dentine or an inactive dentine, inactive uh, caries in dentine that will look a little bit darker brown in color. And moving on to the tactile perception of this enamel, if you take a spoon excavator and try to run it on the lesion, if it is resistant to your excavation or resistant to a sharp probe here, then it is an indication that it is an 
inactive lesion. But if you can scoop through the dentine with your spoon excavator, then it is an active lesion. So the lesion activity gives you a direct understanding that the person is having dental caries disease at that moment. So the idea or the thought process that you will think is, okay, he's actively having disease, like how we will give Cinerest for a patient who's suffering from cold, you will also administer uh, respective uh, risk management strategies for that patient, apart from just filling the cavity or administering remineralizable agents. So this is, these are just a few examples of active lesions versus inactive lesions. On the top surface, both are uh, one is smooth surface, active enamel lesion. The other is a pit and fissure active enamel lesion, whereas the ones on the lower are actually healed enamel lesions, both on smooth surface and pit and fissure. And this is uh, active and inactive lesions in your dentine. So uh, black looking dentine is actually a, a caries that was earlier active arrested or the lesion activity has stopped. So there are based on this methodology, just to improve that how does this uh, caries suddenly get stopped, especially when it is progressed as much as the dentine. And then how suddenly it just stopped is because when the DK ex is exposed or the cavity is exposed to the exterior, it is more uh, accessible to tooth brushing. Say, for example, this condition where the doctor just evened out all the rough enamels by just placing an in a bevel, converted all the active lesions into an inactive lesions within a period of three months' time. So this kind of an approach is also now advocated, a non-restorative approach for cavitated lesions in dentine. So if a person says, so who can, why do we have to do this? In, ideally, in our uh, scenario, college or clinical drilled and filled it with either GIC or a composite resin. But in cases where patient can really not afford or patient says that I will go and come back, I will bring money for the treatment, something like that. This is the least that we can do for them to ensure that at least you arrest the uh, disease process at that particular stage. So this is how an active lesion can heal by itself if you provide a conducive environment. Now, this tooth or this uh, uh, picture does not show much of cavities as such or black areas as such. But if you actually look into the teeth a little bit closer, you can see heavy plaque formation along the gingival aspect. And uh, in fact, the two shows probably the patient has brushed in that area. It shows some amount of demineralization. So when you stand also along with that, one more cue that you can draw from this picture is that the gingival margin is inflamed. So when you have inflamed gingival margins, even if the patient is going to brush that particular morning and you know he's coming to the dentist, but he brushes well, but never followed a hygiene procedures, the gingival inflammation will actually give way to us saying that this person has not been diligent in brushing and is having a disease process. So that is a behavioral management that he needs to be doing. So we would have often seen people who are having uh, diabetes uh, when they want to go for sugar checkup, they will say that you book the appointment 10 days later. And in that 10 days, they will follow proper uh, regimen to make sure that their fasting and postprandial actually comes down. But what gives way there is your glycosylated hemoglobin, which, which cannot be uh, cheated upon. Likewise, look out for marginal gingival inflammation to see if the patient is actually doing his oral hygiene procedures properly. If there's inflamed gingiva, then he's again a high-risk patient. This is a very classical example of uh, arrested uh, or an inactive uh, carious lesion in dentine. Actually, if the patient is not bothered and uh, he's able to chew on this tooth normally, then you actually don't have to restore this cavity. Again, a few more examples of uh, uh, lesions that were earlier active, but then have turned inactive because of uh, just intervention without restorations. So just a few more examples of how uh, a spectrum of ICDAS score can be found in a particular mouth. Now, this again is another huge challenge for uh, cardiologists and clinicians is the fixed orthodontic therapy. 
whenever you see a patient with fixed orthodontic therapy, they are automatically in high risk for dental caries. So you need to administer all preventive management strategies for such patients. So they end up after the treatment, they end up typically with this kind of a presentation of white spot lesions, which is seen around the bracket margin. This is also another example of uh, uh, white spot lesions around the bracket margin. So if you see in this 2-2, you will see that uh, there is some brown enamel that is present. So we often wonder, what is this? I can understand white opaque enamel, but what is this brown enamel? This is uh, nothing but an attempt of the enamel to heal by itself. So it's undergone various phases of demineralization, remineralization. In the process of remineralization, some amount of pigments also get incorporated into the enamel, and that's why it's looking unsightly brown in color. Now, the management strategies for all of this is put forth by a philosophy called as International Caries Classification and Management Systems. We don't uh, no longer call uh, uh, cavity filling as a management strategy. It, it has to be looked as a, as a holistic approach where, you, where they say that we need to look at the history and understand the patient level risk assessment classification of the cavities or lesions that are present in the oral cavity, then based on these two, you synthesize and diagnose if the patient is having dental caries disease. And then you go on manage the uh, problem by personalized caries prevention methods and controlling the cavities and also offering filling procedures if there is a need and scope for that. In this uh, process, caries activity and severity plays a very important role because that will hugely impair our decision on how to go about treating that particular patient. And this system, this ICCMS system, also has a, a prediction chart where you can estimate if this patient will develop future cavities. So I'm not going to discuss all of that because that's, again, another separate lecture altogether. Now, in this entire process of disease management, recall, risk-based recall is very, very important because if we don't recall the patients, then we are not actually managing the disease. We are only treating him at that point in time. So when, when it comes to management, what do we do uh, for management is based on the lesion activity and severity, you will render some treatment. And based on his likelihood to develop new lesions, you will classify the patient into high, moderate, and low. And based on his current stage, you will see if all if uh, the tooth falls in any of this criteria, whether all the teeth are inactive or that it is uh, initial inactive, or that is enamel level uh, caries active lesions and moderate active, which is moderate lesions that are active in nature or extensive caries lesions. So for all inactive lesions and all patients with a likelihood progression, when they don't have any risk for progressing into a bad, further bad state, you just do preventing, preventive measures to prevent cavities. For initial active lesions, you will do non-operative care. So they no longer call as prevention of dental caries. That uh, term has actually now sounded to be a misnomer because you in all your capacity cannot prevent tooth decay, especially when there is so many factors that are playing into, uh, into place. Prevention is very difficult. You can probably prevent COVID-19 if you take uh, a vaccine shot, but uh, the term prevention and dental caries don't go along. So they just speak about risk management and caries management. Okay, nobody speaks about prevention here. So one is a non-operative care where you don't drill, but you just fill the, but you just remineralize the surface. And then you have operative care, which is now called as tooth preserving operative care, because the intention is to just remove what is needed and leave behind whatever is sound, instead of making those typical cavity preparations, which we usually do. Now, uh, this all together is how we manage risk. There is, there is the uh, uh, risk assessment is one part, but managing the risk is actually managing the entire disease part. So your fillings and risk management is a holistic treatment of dental caries as a disease. 
so we have, we've i've been working on this uh, in the past decade and i'm just here to share few experience here we went on to just see the uh, caries experience in school children in chennai measured using ic das so these are typically children belonging to the age group of 12 to 16 so what we uh, 17 years so what we found was uh, a lot of people uh, children had this uh, red band that you see that is the initial enamel lesions because the teeth are just now erupting now if you don't institute uh, remineralizing strategies at that stage then they will probably progress easily into cavitated lesions so this gave us a very good perspective and we saw that a lot of factors were actually playing a role in the uh, progression or expression of the disease in the school children so this is again uh, <laughs> the clinical parameters what all were causing the disease and uh, we also did a quick assessment of the patients uh, visiting uh, uh, the dental op at meenakshi amal dental college and this is the result ideally we are all tuned to measure only the who dmf index the catch on probe that's what we do in our dental op that's what oral medicine people do but the same patients when we try to categorize them based on the lesion severity you can see that a lot of patients actually fall into the score d3 and 4 the ic da score 3 and 4 now uh, in a, in any conventional uh, conservative dentistry op we are not actually equipped to handle score 3 and 4 but we found that a lot of patients needed that minimal intervention in that phase so how many of us are having resin uh, infiltration in our op how many of us stock resin sealants in our op we don't do that and how many of us uh, uh, invest in uh, low viscosity and fissurotomy burrs or small 0.3 mm round burrs we don't insist upon that the smallest burr that we probably have in our burr set or expect our uh, children our students to have is a 330 burr but uh, for score 3 and especially score 3 management you might sometimes need a 0.3 mm burr so now when you measure dk experience using ic das whole of this logistic management also comes into place and same holds true for your clinical practice as well so if you see 80% of the population who visited meenakshi amal dental college at that point in time actually needed minimal intervention care do we read and write for that in our essay question especially it's a very favorite essay question in postgrad curriculum we actually don't have the methods and materials to support mid clinical practice something that ic das and iccms will expose us to and the among the patients who visited 73% of patients showed a likelihood of progress into further severe state of dental caries disease Have this plan of calling these patients if they are stabilized or have they progressed further we don't have a plan for that in our uh, op or in our clinical practice so this is very important when we are talking about this management we have incorporated uh, cariology as a subject in third bds as well as cariology as a module in the pg program where four departments will attend that module what we do here is you do the risk assessment based on the and then you do the treatment according to that non invasive microinvasive or and you compute the dmf scores in the beginning before treatment what is this course you have all the pre operative photographs at the first visit you render all the necessary treatment including diet counseling and education about dental caries as a disease and how they can prevent the disease by themselves then we make the patients report back to the op so every student is expected to at least call back and submit their such documentation this documentation of the uh, uh, of the entire uh, process so when we say uh, uh, what seven 
a practical work for uh, a particular subject we always have quota right we have 10 amalgams five stews and then we have 15 gic's but here the quota is to ask treat a patient for all the problems that they have but call them back after 3 months and see that their dmf has not increased so that is the quota for cardiology curriculum but for both undergraduate and postgraduate so when they call back the patient you know that the patient is going to come and then so you should have counseling adequate when you call and you see that the dmf has worsened that means that he is not the, the patient is not following whatever you've said and he probably needs different treatment strategy but if the dmf has stabilized then you have achieved a success in actually controlling the disease process so this needs to be focused on both in your uh, in your clinical practice and also i feel in the dental curriculum as such and i'm very glad that uh, we are able to do this uh, at our department in savita dental college why this is important is because it's just similar uh, diabetes you when a patient is first diagnosed with diabetes you don't just give them oral hypoglycemics and say okay you should not eat sugar you should exercise properly have these tablets and leave my clinic you always call back a diabetic at least three months once in three months for the first year so that's how it is to see if the uh, sugar uh, sugar levels are in control the same thing is what has to be executed for patients with diabetes as a disease call them back and make sure that the disease has stabilized. So the outcomes of uh, following kind of uh, practice is that health maintenance, oral health maintenance is on a holistic approach. The disease control is complete and it is patient-centered quality-oriented treatment. That's what we are trained to do. Dentists treat health, oral health. So that's, that's what we will be actually doing. And the wider impacts of ICCMS allows it to be extrapolated to the population where policies and decisions can be made on a different and a broader perspective. So take home message for today is first understand that caries is a dynamic disease. It's not, uh, it's not like a single disease. It can reverse heal by itself. Measuring the disease is more important than measuring the cavities or the lesion. And when we measure the lesion, you also measure the lesion activity so that it gives you the measurement of the disease itself. And ICCMS is a holistic way or an approach to manage the disease rather than just filling cavities. <coughs> so here on, let's aim to treat the disease and not just focus on filling cavities. With that, I thank you all for your patient hearing. I hope that uh, uh, there's somewhere, some uh, some point you found uh, a difference in what you have been doing all this while. And maybe if, if even a few of you embrace this concept, uh, I, I would think it to, it to be a huge success. Thank you. And thank you, Team SRM, once again for having me here. Thank you. Dr. Parotima, I'm not able to hear you clearly. Hello. Uh, Parotima, I think your network is unstable. No. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Am I audible now? Yes, perfectly clear. We lost you somewhere in the middle. I think. Am I audible? Some you are audible now. Oh yeah. Okay. 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 And uh, sorry for the glitch. So, thank you, Doctor Kritika, for sharing an unconventional path, and actually, you are visiting something. A very uh, a topic which is slow, but people do not dare to because it's a difficult topic and it is it requires a shift in the thought process. But then you have uh, uh, talked about the dynamics of dental caries and it was a lovely journey of understanding dental caries through lesion severity and activity. Now it was a very modest gesture from you to pay tribute to your mentors. 
and uh, you have sensitized the participants towards ORCA, which is very nice of you. And you have clearly explained the difference between disease process and disease expression. Now the decision-making and scoring criteria of ICDS have been clearly explained and especially how to effectively and biologically manage caries. That's very important. Now all this time we were only detecting caries. Now we are in a position to diagnose caries. As you must know, a lot of interest is generated and questions are pouring in, but I'm not very sure how many questions we can take. So let us just start taking the questions. First, a uh, very cliched question is, does magnification help in ICDS score one and two assessment? Thank you for asking that question. It's a very important question. No, please don't use magnification when you do ICDS. Though we are now currently living in this age of uh, microscopes and loops, actually magnifications can sometimes be counterproductive in overestimating the problem. So they actually advise, there's been research studies that have shown that if you use magnification, they will, then you will end up over-diagnosing the problem. So you just need your beautiful eyes to visualize one and two scores. Thank you. Thank you. And another question is what you have answered this question partially though. What if we see two score criteria in a single tooth? Yeah. So if you see two scores in a single tooth, then first thing that you have to understand that the patient is having a very active disease state because it, it's progressing very fast. But clinically, when you chart that tooth, you will only always mark the worst score. Now, uh, different people chart it differently. Some people chart based on the surfaces and some people chart based on their tooth. If you're charting the surfaces, then there is no issue because you can chart whichever score is there. But if you're going to just chart it for that particular tooth, it is always better to uh, place the worst score for that particular tooth because that's what is going to determine what treatment you're going to perform on that tooth. And uh, But it should give you a good tooth. It means that he's in a very active disease state. So you need to look at the disease management per se, more than the lesion management. Okay, thank you. And another last quick question is, uh, suppose there's a score four, though the surface is intact, the lesion beneath may be large. Do subcategories exist? So when there is a score four, uh, why they have introduced a score four in uh, lesion progression is because it is sometimes often missed. Okay, so uh, the idea is to look out for these dark discolorations, especially in a proximal lesion. But uh, there is once if it is a score four, then the direct indication is to take the bore and drill. It's only after score three that you don't drill. So depend once you take a bar and drill, so it will either be a, it can be a score six also after you place the bar, or it could be a score five, depending on how the depth of the decay you just uh, uh, perform the treatment. So once you drilled, you drilled. So you just have to uh, perform the uh, complete the treatment. There are no sub scores to score four, though I understand that the extension can be at different planes. Right. Thank you, very clearly explained. Now, if you would be kind enough to take a few questions, though it was said this was the last question. So this is, uh, what is the role of diagnodent in ICDS? Again, a very uh, pertinent and an important question. Please don't invest in diagnodents. It is of no use because diagnodents are good in detecting cavitated lesions in dentine, which your human eye can itself detect their sensitivity and specificity to detect uh, enamel demineralizations is uh, very poor. It's about 67, uh, 67 to 65 to 67%. Likewise, your uh, proximal lesion access to diagnodent is also very poor. So diagnodent was a nice uh, uh, thing to flaunt about, but uh, it does, uh, evidence doesn't uh, show uh, too much of uh, favor to buy it. Same thing holds for QLF as well. Thank you. And uh, one of our participants wants to know where can we find the ICDS chart for use in our practice? Okay, so there is this website. Just play, uh, type in iccms.org. It will take you to this ICDS website. They've kept, they've placed a dedicated website. You can create a login for yourself. They offer training for you to you know, uh, 
go through uh, several training sessions and they have a lot of uh, downloadable material uh, for this. So you can just visit ICCMS website. Nicely explained. I think all the queries are answered and uh, even if few queries will be there, I think Madam is available. Uh, she's put up her uh, contact. So uh, now here I will take an opportunity, this opportunity to tell that uh, in our institute, we have started this particular ICDS criteria, using this particular ICDS criteria for KDS detection, diagnosis, and management for the last two years. And I think it will be great if some collaborations could be invited so that we can pull in a lot of data because my PhD was on KDS epidemiology. That is the time when I learned that uh, KDS has to be understood to actually treat it. We are not mechanics. We cannot just drill and fill. And you have given a very good perspective. And I think our participants will feel encouraged and interested enough to actually practice the gap that you have mentioned. We are writing essays, but we do not practice. So I think we need to shift our focus. And thank you very much, Dr. Kritika Datta, Kim Asara. Thank you, Vidya Madam. Mahalakshmi, madam, of course, for giving me this opportunity. I think, uh, madam, if you could wait a little while, we are going to present a little certificate. Of Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kritika. Yet again, a wonderful lecture from you. I'm sure the interns would have understood the wide scope of research that is available in this topic. You've really taken this topic to the level of the undergraduates. Thank you very much. You've made us proud that we, did, we made a good choice to start the whole series with you as the first lecture. Thank you once again. And we would like to thank our dear Paromita ma'am for her valuable time in spite of her busy schedule uh, arranging for the NAC inspection. Ma'am has agreed to be the moderator. Thank you, ma'am. We would like to honor you with a certificate of appreciation for being the moderator.